So friends, we've been talking about let's see, the movement of populations toward Baha'u'llah. And you, as you've gathered, this is really something quite different than the first 150 years that we were talking about yesterday. Because we're no longer counting numbers of believers, we're no longer counting how many local assemblies, national assemblies, structures, and so on. But actually looking at the influence of the faith on populations as a whole, uh, and how the, the, the faith is influencing culture and organization and values in, in broader, uh, in, in whole communities. Now, I want to just talk about, there, there's actually two ways this goes on. There's this uh, aspect that Joni's been talking about where the Baha'i community is reaching out to the wider community and focusing its activities actually on serving that wider community. At the same time, there's something else going on, which is if that's pulling the populations, there's something else that's going on that's pushing them from behind. Uh, and that has to do with what the Guardian called the greater plan of God. There's an educational process which is going on in the world, uh, which is involving some very difficult lessons, but which is making people more receptive, more interesting, more interested, and also teaching lessons that people are not always ready to learn just by sheer logic. People are learning through the suffering, through the turmoil that surrounds us. And this is also part of the movement of populations uh, toward Baha'u'llah in, in our time. And I think that this also presents some interesting challenges for us uh, in learning how to read our reality, how to be alert to ways that world events and trends in the wider society affect receptivity. As we go through these turbulent times, learning to manage our own discomfort, which is inevitable, but we need to manage it, and how to develop the capacity to engage in meaningful conversations with other people who are moved and pushed and disturbed and upset by this, uh, these trends. Um, we often want to, in, in trying to make sense of what's going on around us, it's very useful to, appear, to uh, refer to the, the basic analytic tools that the Guardian has provided to us. Uh, for example, the notion that there are, there's an integrated pro there are integrated processes and there are disintegrated processes. You could also call it construction and demolition. The building of a house, or at least the let's say the, the rebuilding of a house involves a demolition phase before you can start to build uh, the, new, the new part. And likewise, as the Guardian explains, this world, there are many institutions, many habits, many ways of doing things that need to fall apart in order to clear the space for the new, the new world order to, to grow up. So it's, it's useful to understand that this is, this is part of the, the system, that the the destruction, which we are not involved with, is nonetheless part of God's plan for the education of humanity, uh, for the opening of minds. And the Guardian also talks about our role, and in some ways it's related to this integrative, constructive process as being the, the minor plan. And then he refers to the, to the greater plan of God, which is these larger forces uh, in the world. And one of the things that we can do is, is pay close attention in, in attempting to, be, to learn how to be more sophisticated in our understanding of these forces and also more, more articulate in being able to engage in meaningful conversations about them. Uh, and often we don't want, our purpose is not to discuss world events, but if that's where people are, we need to engage the conversation at that point and then draw them into more positive uh, areas. But in learning this, I think it's very useful to pay attention, close attention to the passages in the letters of the House of Justice uh, in which they model, in a way, this sort of analysis. Uh, I brought as an example a, a letter 
which the House of Justice or the Secretariat uh, wrote on the 27th of April this year to an individual in the United States. This letter was then shared with the National Assembly, which shared it with the community in general. Um, but they point out, for example, that, and, and there are many important lessons in it, but uh, how we need to be aware that even when political parties or, or others promote something that sounds very much like a Baha'i principle, either it can be a, just a, a sham or, or a manipulation, or it can be actually quite sincere. But it's not going to work if it doesn't pass through a process of consensus building. Um, they say that um, the, because of the fundamental partisanship in contemporary political life, policies are often implemented without building consensus, and consequently seeds of discontent and continuing political struggle are sown. Um, Conflict and contention ultimately yield more conflict and contention. Eliminating social problems rather than merely ameliorate them requires unity of thought as well as action, an open heart as well as an open hand, conditions which Baha'u'llah's revelation is intended to bring about. So you have on the one hand things that appear to be idealistic and really aren't. Then you have some that are genuinely idealistic because people don't have the patience to build consensus across the divisions of society are doomed to failure because of the way they are, they are implemented. Uh, another example in this same letter, they talk about, about the international scheme and say that for many decades following the second great war of the 20th century, humanity moved with fits and starts toward the promise of the United World. The failure to complete the project of the unification of nations, however, left gaps in relations in which supranational problems could fester and threaten the security and well-being of peoples and states, leading to a recrudescence of prejudice, diverse expressions of factionalism, and a virulent nationalism that are the very negation of Baha'u'llah's message of peace and oneness. So this is just another way of analyzing that this post-war movement towards uh, greater unity towards international structures, and the, the European Union is an excellent example of that, uh, were incomplete. And because they, 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 they didn't continue in that direction, it left problems like the environment, problems like migration, un, without, without appropriate re, uh, solutions. And then these problems are now causing the reaction in the other direction. I give these just as examples because the House of Justice is continually providing us with this, this help. And when we read and, and reflect on what they're actually saying, these can be extremely useful uh, in, our, in our conversations. Now I want to mention a few other um, of the kinds of things that we should be thinking about and aware of as we read the newspapers and watch the uh, television news. Uh, clearly, the disruption caused by technological change and by globalization is one of the factors which is underlying many, much of the disruption. Another thing is this matter thing which Michael Carborough calls the culture of contest, which is the whole idea that everything is best resolved by contest conflicting interests and conflicting factions and so on. And this actually serves as a kind of justification or cover for exploitation, where the, the rich and the powerful benefit from this and sort of use this ideology to kind of cover and justify what is actually acquisition and, uh, and, and selfishness. Uh, <clears throat> the corruption in political spheres doesn't require a lot of comment, but I think it's worth reflecting a little bit on how much we're seeing in the economic sphere, where one, the assumption was that competition, the marketplace would keep everybody honest and prices going down and so on. I remember being shocked decades ago when we learned that um, the companies making electric uh, bulbs in the, uh, in the United States had colluded 
to prevent, there was a new kind of bulb that would last for, for 10 years and the companies colluded to prevent them from going to the market so they could go on selling the ones that go bad every six months. That was, that was shocking at the time, but the waves of things that we have come since then, um, and, and I mean, most of my examples are, are American ones, but um, the, the Enron, the 2008 crash because of these sales of, of uh, packaged mortgages, uh, the pharmaceutical companies that are actually selling opioids out the back door, uh, and then recently in, in Europe, this case of the, of the diesel motor cars, which for decades, these companies have been selling uh, as environmentally friendly, and not only have they been gaming the regulations in such a way that the worst pollution was not detected, but they've even persuaded the governments to subsidize diesel fuel on the theory that this was preventing uh, p pollution. And all of this in little collusion and working, working together. Now, it, 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 it boggles the mind, but the, these things need to be recognized for what they are. Um, this mechanism of, of the way that fear and tribal relation, feelings or feelings of ethnic unity are manipulated by politicians. Um, the way that polarization or the division can then lead to demonization of the other side, making it, spreading the idea that the other side are not really human or not decent people. Um, you see this is the kind of mechanism that led in the, uh, in the last century to the Holocaust. It's the same kind of mechanism that happens uh, in Rwanda and Burundi and led to the genocide there. Uh, and, we can see already the dangers of that in the society here around us uh, when people cease to respect each, the, the, the views and the point of view and the needs and the concerns of other, of other parties. Um, emotionally driven pendulum swings in, in politics, I don't go into the detail now, but I think it's quite clear with retrospect that in the United States, uh, without Bush, we would not have had Obama. Without Obama, we wouldn't have Trump. <laughs> that this sort of swinging back and forth, the emotional reactions are driving uh, these things. And then just, um, I mean, just stepping back and looking at things, economic factors, which reflect the values of society. Compare the annual earnings of a football player or a singer to a school teacher. Which is valuable to society? The education of the next generation or an hour's entertainment at the television? <laughs> In essence, our society is saying that we put a value of a thousand times more on the entertainment than we do on educating our children. What does this say about our society? Anyway, I mention these things simply because they are when we give thought to them and we're able to articulate some of these things, these are ways that we can build a, a, a conversation uh, which may then lead into more spiritual and positive ways. But we need to understanding the, the world uh, around us. Um, we've seen how the, how the progress of the faith has been anything but linear. We know that, that there's going to be more trouble in society as we, as we go ahead. Um, but we also know that these disruptions are related to, res to, to um, receptivity. And as we go through the, the turbulent times ahead, we need to be looking at uh, ways that, um, that we can turn these things into constructive conversations. Um, we need, we'll be needing confidence and increasing capacity, again to use the words of the House of Justice, to frame concerns in a way that rises above fissures, to share views in a manner that transcends divisive approaches, and to create and participate in spaces to work together in the quest to enact solutions to the problems that bedevil their nation. 
So I'm just inviting as we work together in building our community activities, in our outreach, in our um, community building and influencing of culture locally, that we also continue to be outward looking in the sense of aware of uh, international developments, developments outside our community, and be able to uh, engage in conversations on these that are promoting unity, promoting positive values, and that can help to uh, uh, draw our friends and acquaintances and indeed whole populations closer to Baha'u'llah.